Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here or have been sitting in the shadows and you enjoy what you are listening to, please show some love to that subscribe button and also set your notification bell to all. That way you don't miss any time I upload a video, which tends to be daily. Also, if you are interested in becoming a member or would like to buy me a coffee as a special thank you, all of that information can be found down below. With all of that being said, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person in the morning. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in to get warm, and get ready for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Ouija Stories. Right after this intro and ad will play, I'll read the first story and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer. This video is for educational and entertainment purposes. This past summer, me and my friend were on a spooky kick. You know, scary movies, sleepover games, midnight rituals, the works. Just a bunch of stuff to freak us out. The ending of this kick, of course, was to play with the Ouija board. We bought it then, went over to her friend's house, because she was house-sitting and it was empty. We arrived, looked up rules, lit candles, and followed everything the internet said to do. At first, we weren't getting anything. We were both wishful thinking, I think, and were subconsciously moving it at first. It was going really slow and not making any sense, so we looked up what to do if nothing was working, and it said to take a break and come back to it, so that's what we did. When we came back as soon as we did, the board started answering our questions. I'm a former self-harmer and have a suicidal past and things like that. The first thing that alarmed me was that it said there were 13 entities in the room with us. I asked how many were bad and it said 12 out of 13 were bad. The second thing was that it spelled out my last name. I kept asking what about it and finally it answered that they liked me. I asked why and it said you bleed which I instantly just knew they were talking about my self-harm which was terrifying. So, we stopped, said goodbye and everything, and took another break. We came back and asked it if there was something that I should know. It proceeded to tell me a very huge secret that my friend was keeping from me. She tried to stop, and when she did it, it gave me even more details about what happened. We stopped then, because neither of us could handle it anymore. We threw the board away in a McDonald's dumpster and tried not to think about it. About two weeks later, the board was back and in my friend's mom's back seat. No idea how it got there. My friend knew nothing of it and how it got there, and her mom didn't even know we did it because we would get into huge trouble. After playing with the board for about two weeks after, I constantly felt watched and this deep, heavy feeling walking around in my house. I heard noises constantly. One time my phone glitched and distorted the voice on the other end and then shut off. A bang went off in my face one night that sounded like someone punching the wall as hard as they could and hearing noises in the cupboard and opening it to find cups and bowls flipped over completely or on their sides. All of this went away though, and I rarely feel things, although sometimes that heavy feeling always comes back. Okay, so before I begin, I would like to explain this story a bit. It is quite controversial. I've commented on other people's stories about this experience. Some people believe me and some didn't. I don't ask that you believe. I just tell the story to mainly make people aware that Ouija boards should be taken 
very seriously. Make sure to look up proper procedures and how to use it before playing around with one. So, I'd like to begin with this story. I've tried to forget and I can't remember every single detail. I can't remember every one of the questions that we ask. The answers we received, I can remember. Mm, a few, but not a hundred percent. I remember what happened with me, though. In this story is my brother Nick, my sister-in-law Brittany, her friend Ashley, and my girlfriend at the time, Katie. And with that, let's begin. I'm going to take you back to the summer of 2010 again. This year, I had a rush of getting into the paranormal. The fact that ghosts and demons are real fascinated me and would make my adrenaline pump when I would encounter such things. Well, this particular night, my sister-in-law had asked me if I had ever taken part in a Ouija board and at the time, I had no clue what that even was, so she knew obviously I never had. So she began explaining what Ouija boards are and how they work, and such then, she asked me if I would like to experience it for myself. Of course, just at the thought, my heart had skipped a beat, so we decided that we would do it, and I had to find a place to do it. Her parents wouldn't let us do it at their house. My brother and her were only dating at this time, let alone around the house. So me and my brother decided to fuck it. I knew mom and dad won't let us do it inside, but outside on the porch or in the garage shouldn't be a big deal, right? So we go down to my parents' house and we start setting up shop on my back porch. Got a candle, matches, pen and paper, grab some chairs, around a table, and set ourselves around it. Just as we were starting, my heart started pumping so fast and hard because I was really nervous. Was this really going to work, I wondered? So we all put our hands over the Ouija, and Brittany had one hand over it, so she could write with her other hand and she started by asking if there was any friendly spirits around us that would like to communicate. The Ouija board moved to no, and I started freaking out. I'm only barely touching this fucking thing. I mean, my fingers are pretty much just hovering over it with a paper-thin gap away from the planchette, the triangular-shaped piece, usually with a small glass circle in the center used to cast over letters and such to communicate with. I asked if anybody was moving it, and I told them to stop messing with me. I ain't got time for this bullshit, and everyone was saying no, we're not playing around with you. We want this to work just as bad as you are, and Brittany asked Nick to be serious. Are you playing around and to stop it if so? And he said, he wasn't. He wanted it to work too. So then Brittany's voice became firm, and she stated that only benevolent entities are welcomed here, and any violent entities were not welcome to speak with us, and that they could go ahead and leave or we'll just end the session. So we wait a few minutes, all place our hands over the planchette again, and Brittany states again. Are there any spirits here with us tonight that would like to communicate with us? The planchette slowly moved to yes. So sure, maybe an entity was lying to us. Who knows, right? But we decide to keep going, trying to communicate with the spirit. Brittany asks, is there anybody particular here that you would like to speak with? The board this time pretty swiftly moved to yes and back to the center. Now, usually you are the ones that would push the planchette back to the center, but this spirit just seemed to guide it the entire time we were communicating with it. Brittany begins to ask it, who would it like to communicate with first? The board slowly spelt out Ashley's name. Now Ashley began getting nervous, asking, why me? Why does it want to start with me? 
She seemed to be getting nervous and shit. I would too, if it had specified, wanting to communicate with me first. So Brittany tells Ashley to ask it something that this spirit could be a relative and such. Could be possibly a demon lying. Ask a question that only you would know the answer to. Something that could be an easy guesser. And Ashley asked what year the spirit had died, if it had ever lived. I can't remember the year it spilled out, but I do remember her exclaiming that that was the year her mother had passed away. And she began getting frantic and sad, but she was interested. So Brittany told her to ask questions only her mother would know. I can't remember all of these, but Ashley asked personal questions only her mom would know. Not even any of us would have known, and things started getting creepy. So, here's Ashley becoming very emotional, believing she is really speaking with her mother. At one point, one of us would take our finger off and see if it would go with just three of us, then two of us, then just Ashley herself and the planchette would still slightly move around with just Ashley hovering two fingers above the piece. Whoever it was had a strong connection with her. I remember the spirit spelling out how thankful it was Ashley, my sister-in-law, that her mother never left her side, and that was just happy. She had a real friend in her life that truly cared for her daughter. After all of this had happened, and I mean we spent a good time over an hour, maybe even two hours communicating for Ashley, and Ashley felt she had asked enough. We asked that her mother's spirit stay, especially with us, and asked if there was any other friendly spirits around that would like to communicate with us, and if so, she could watch over us. Well, the board went to yes, and no. We asked what it meant, and it slowly spelt out, evil and good, and that they, the good, fought evil away. We thanked her mother and the other spirits for protecting us, and asked her mother if she would communicate with us with the others. The board went to yes. So we all began taking turns. My brother, then Katie, just asking random questions. My brother being stupid and saying how he would die. And I forget what the board said. I think it said something about age, assuming it was saying old age. And he said, that shit's lame. And the girls all gave him shit because I guess you're not supposed to ask questions like that. There's some things you shouldn't ask because you should know. You should just let things play out naturally. Well, it gets to be my turn, and I couldn't really think of much. I knew I was thinking about asking it if I was going to die young like my brother and ask just to piss off the girls. But to be honest, when I was younger, I never thought I was going to make it past 18. I just felt like I was here for a good time, not a long time. Still kind of feel that way, but obviously, I made it to 18. Well, actually, I barely did. Anyway, I asked it if my grandfather was okay and if he made it to heaven. I got a yes and a proud response. Then I asked it if I was going to be a successful football player. That year, I had just received offers to go play for the Miami Hurricanes and Ole Mississippi, and I wanted to know if I could go pro. The board said yes. I got excited, but hence I asked it if I could not, if I would. Then, I asked what offer I should take, what would be the best for me. It said Mississippi. I got excited because that was the school that I wanted to go to but I also felt like maybe these were easy answers. Maybe it can read what I want, and that's how it's answering now. Who knows if we were still communicating with Ashley's mom? So 
I asked it if I would make it to Ole Miss. The board said no. I got hurt. That shit fucked me up. I asked it why. It slowly spelt out, accident. I said, what accident? Am I going to get hurt? It said, yes. Now, everybody was getting nervous, but I was getting pretty pissed, and Brittany reminded me that I was asking questions that you should not be asking the Ouija. But now I was invested to hell with it. I wanted to know. I slowly spelt out, car and death. Well, at this point, Brittany had enough. I was asking questions that I shouldn't be, and so had my brother, and she didn't like the feeling she was receiving anymore from the energy in the room, and she decided to begin ending the session. Well, that's just what she did. Well, now we'll shortly get to why I'm telling you this story. It's to warn people about Ouija's. A year and a half later, so 2011, in my junior year, I got a job at a pizza place delivering pizzas after football season to help my parents out by paying my own cell phone bill, gas and such, and helping them out if they needed it. Well, one night, a night that I, to this day, can't even remember. I only remember what I was told. I got into a really bad car accident while at work one night. Apparently, from what an eyewitness has told police, was the doctors and police told me the next morning, when I finally gained consciousness at around 7 to 8 a.m., I was coming around a corner on US-1. It's an old highway down here in Florida, with a bit of traffic following me. On the other end were two cars parked side by side in the median. One of the vehicles, well, the one I hit, was parked in the median, but majority out on the road of the highway. So, here came me in a bunch of traffic with nowhere to go. I slammed into this lady's back end of her trailblazer, going at about 75 miles an hour. I don't wear a seatbelt, so I bounced the hell around the inside of this car, hitting my windshield and blowing out my driver window with my face, and I hit her so hard that our cars bounced apart, and my vehicle almost went off the edge into the water. It's a big river next to the highway. The front end of my vehicle was crushed all the way to my windshield. There was nothing left, really. I'm sorry I said I'd keep it, you know, short. I got a grade 3 concussion, a contusion on my forehead, the size of a cantaloupe, maybe bigger, and tore my meniscus, broke my leg, and such. I stayed in the ICU for two weeks. Didn't get to go back to school that year. I was on hospital homebound because I got so messed up I could barely walk from torn muscles and fractures in my legs. I was having seizures and doctors were afraid of me bumping my head, saying I could easily die. So I stayed in a wheelchair for a few months at home. So yeah, I never got to play football again. I lost my scholarships and couldn't help but think, for the love of fucking God, did this happen to me because I had asked this Ouija about this? and it had said this would happen? If I never did ask, would it have? Long story short, either don't fuck around with the Ouija's or be very careful out there if you do so, guys. I used a Ouija board once with my two younger brothers. We were 11, 13, and 15. We had heard around school about them, so we naturally were curious. A girl that went to our school, we didn't know her that well, had passed away, so we thought we would try to communicate with her. I recall the experience quite well to this day. I'm 40 now. We started asking for her specifically, calling out her name loud and clear. Nothing happened for a while, but we kept at it. 
Finally, the piece started to move to, yes, and I remember we were so excited. I could tell from my brother's reactions that this was genuine and none of us were moving the piece. I remember how it seemed to float across the board so easily. We asked about their... We asked what their name was, and it spelled out her exact name. Some backstory. When I originally heard of her passing, I started to learn more about her just from everybody talking about her. She apparently had a phrase she used to always say, and I happened to recall that phrase that day and thought, why not ask if this spirit knew? So I asked the question, and the piece started to spell out her six-word phrase perfectly. It was just shocking. How is this possible? My brothers didn't know her phrase, so they couldn't spell it out if they wanted to. As we got into it more, she started pulling back, and her responses started getting broken and short. We then didn't get any response from her at all and the piece sat still for a while. We took a break for a bit and then came back to it as it was such an adrenaline rush. We started playing again and connected with a different person and spirit. Didn't get a name though. We started asking silly questions about girlfriends and grades, etc. Then, for some reason, I decided to up the ante. Will I live past 20? Not sure why I asked that question, but I did. The piece, without hesitation, then moved towards no. I freaked out and ran upstairs to tell my parents. They calmed me down and told me everything would be okay and that we should stop playing with that silly board. So we did, and I haven't touched it once to this day. Five years passed by. I hit 20 years old, so I'm in the clear. Side note to that, my parents told me years later that when I reached 20, they were quite relieved. Apparently, they had experiences with Ouija boards back when they were younger, so they were a bit unsettled when I told them what the board spelt out for my future. One year after that, so a total of six years have now passed since we played. My brother was killed in a car accident at the age of 18. And thinking back about it, all three of us had a finger on the piece, so perhaps energy lines were crossed and the message was meant for him. Obviously, it could also be a coincidence, but after the girl's spirit spelt out her signature phrase, it was very hard for me to deny what was going on. Are our paths laid out before we arrive? Can these spirits tap into those paths and predict outcomes? As I'm writing this, I'm recalling other strange events that occurred after my brother's death. This is a true story, 100%. A few months after my brother died, I was out with a buddy at a bar in a city I had never been to. We had met some new people at the bar and were sitting in these booths down in the lower level. I wasn't drinking, so I was completely sober, and I overheard a conversation next to me between two guys. The one guy laughs out loud and has this look of astonishment on his face. He then looks over at me and says to the guy he's talking to, Now do him. I have no clue what's going on, just met these people. The guy turns around and faces me. He then says, I know this will sound weird, but can I hold your watch and bracelet? I laughed. He laughs. Then an awkward pause. Then more pausing. He nods. I say, okay then, here you go. He then holds them in his hand and looks down towards the ground with his eyes closed. About five seconds pass, he looks back up at me and his expression has changed. He says, Oh, I am so sorry. You just lost your brother. My jaw is on the floor. Eyes started to well up. What just happened? He didn't get that info from my friend, and he didn't know me. 
This shit was crazy. Anyway, to circle back, I don't blame the Ouija board for what I said, nor do I believe I started a curse or anything like that. I've heard other predictions from people over the years after my brother's passing that has come true. One person in particular stood out that worked with the local police in locating missing people. As well, I've heard about spirit guides and their role of delivering information to people on our side. Perhaps that's what a Ouija board is, a spirit guide and it's just a conduit to deliver information. From all that I have heard, the predictions felt like someone was reading from a script, like they could read something that I couldn't. Some were better at reading the script than others as I found out while events unfolded. Some predictions were repeated at different times by different people. That to me is very interesting. How can one person tell me a very, very specific statement and then I hear the exact same statement from a person years later? In my opinion, there is something going on out there that's just on a different level of connectivity. If that's true, I'm definitely haunting my kids. <laughs> Sorry, you all did not see that ending coming. <laughs> all right, back to the stories. <laughs> Over 10 years ago, I opened up a portal in my life in which I may never understand or lose. There are still days I feel the presence, and I believe I will be perpetually followed by a manifestation of my actions. Even recently, I've begun having a weird habit of almost psychosis-like, uncontrollable dark thinking. Just go kill yourself repeated over the course of just a few days in my head last month more than 50 times. This happened for things as large as depressive wallowing or as small as forgetting to do something. I unconsciously formed devil horns in my hands every day, have a strange obsession with a cult imagery and the enlightened eye of Lucifer that you may or may not notice propagated literally everywhere in music. Where is the best place to hide the truth? In plain sight. When I was in high school, I was overweight and drawn to outsider, extremist crowds. We wore black, we listened to death metal, and we caused as much general mayhem as possible, all the while toting a pack of Parliament cigarettes like we were Bill Vallow halfway through his daily fifth of Jack. In these times, there was one group which I grew to like, trust, and unlikely subject my innocence and soul. My friends introduced the Ouija board to me as something they really wanted to delve into. When I was persuaded, we didn't just delve, we dove. I turned away from my Catholic upbringing and began to search for evil so that we could translate that to our experience with the board. This was because our first few plays were typical of a new Ouija user's experience. The board moved very little. We questioned who was even moving it in the first place, and we had exhausted our haunted venues. I introduced a satanic mantra to the group, and it was welcomed to the table inside of my friend. Cody's house. We were getting tired of the effort it took to get into graveyards and abandoned buildings, so his dad's place was gonna have to do. We put the board on his kitchen table, huddling around it with our hands on the planchette, and chanted the mantra, Archangel, Dark Angel, lend me thy light, through death's bell until we have heaven in sight. Six times, pause, six times, pause, six times. 
What a bad idea. What an ignition of torment. These are the events as followed from our many experiences with the board after that, with the house that we cursed, and what I've dealt with since. The board became a hub of life. No matter who touched it, no matter how light we tried to touch it, the board would speak in volumes at a very rapid pace. It would always spell words in their entirety to form whole sentences, correctly in English, and strap in and out of wonderment and vulgar slandering. For example, the board told me in 2006 that Obama was going to be President of the United States. This was before any decisions were even made in his own party. It also told me that by 2012, the world will have been destroyed by his actions. It spoke at length about salvation, pointing out that certain friends were to die early and suffer. Those of faith, like myself, and very little of my cohorts, were to possibly see salvation if we changed certain aspects of my life. And yes, it laid our deepest fears of why we wouldn't be able to see heaven on the table for the rest of our friends to read. For example, it told me that I needed to stop with premarital sex or I would have no chance. My biggest worry at the time, how did it know? It also adamantly swore there were friends of mine who were doomed to burn for the rest of eternity, who had no chance of heaven no matter what they did. You see, we knew what we were looking to find, what to talk to, a demon or a well-known entity of evil, from classic Lucifer to Anton Lavi and Alistair Crowley, and it manifested in various ways through the board. They told us that the greatest part about hell was being a slave. The worst part about hell was being a slave. Cody loved the adrenaline and ended up buying a new board. With this board, we went even further. This is something hard to fess up to, and even harder to allude to in a confessional as a Catholic to a respected priest. But I still do in light of my soul and personal beliefs. With the new board, I found a backward recording of the Lord's Prayer and let it rip. Oh, the movement. The board would flit between the answers yes and no faster than we could think to stop it. It also became more evil and malevolent in its answering. One day, we invited a host of extra friends. They were friends I knew. We began with the usual questions. It shouldn't know the answer to. Flipping it off and watching the board spell back fuck you. And when they had witnessed the power of what we had invoked, a friend named Jordan started to lose his cool. No way this is real. You have to be making this shit up. He exclaimed in disbelief. Acting like a pompous know-it-all, he took the Bible he had brought for his own peace of mind and plopped it onto the table. Immediately, the planchette sprung into action with one of the most memorable things the board ever communicated. Take the Bible off the table or else I'll burn this house down, fuckers. It spelled every letter and we all went nuts. Of course, the house did not burn down after Jordan refused to move the Bible, but it has gotten us in other ways. Cody's house became a bona fide place of strange. Like I said, I had many friends and this one was full of needy people that mooched off each other. That being said, there was a constant string of people coming and going, passing out on couches and acting like the place was theirs. Cody's dad worked out of town 90% of the time and that was taken advantage of. One of the kids that always stayed there, who played with us regularly, 
stopped wanting to be over there because he would constantly see a staunch white face that would glare at him through windows. Cody saw little sleep in that house and would wake up in living nightmares, he said. For example, one sleep he awoke in the middle of the night, 3 a.m. is a real supernatural hour, and felt extremely uneasy. Soon, he began to hear haunting moans, which culminated in a mass of hands reaching up and over the bed as if they were going to grab him and pull him into Hades. A good friend of mine, who I stupidly introduced, had the worst visible reaction of any of us. We finished a session and were cruising around in my car to rehash the experience. Midway through this, he stops talking to me. I pause for an answer, and in my waiting, I hear an odd breathing. He turns out to be basically panting like a dog. I pulled over him and got out to go to his side. He was positioned leaning downward in the passenger seat, but had also had one arm up holding the oh shit handle. It was as if he was glued to it, panting and panting. I could only think how strange and stupid his behavior was. When I started to try and help by touching him to get out of the car, he only panted harder. I began to think it couldn't be a joke. This scared the shit out of me, so I drove five minutes across our small town to the Catholic Church. I had no idea what to do, but I had an inkling. I pulled him out of the car and basically spilled him onto the sidewalk of the church, right in front of a statue of the Virgin Mary. He writhed on the pavement, but eventually came to and was extremely disoriented. To this day, I don't know if he was playing a joke on me or if it was real, but it did something to frighten me. In this time, I noticed that I became more withdrawn and spiteful. I hated my classmates and wanted nothing to do with the popular and liked people in our school. I began to research the occult and download literature from respected names in evil such as the aforementioned Alistair, Anton, and H.P. Lovecraft. One day, my mother came down into my room in the basement. She didn't say much, but I could tell she was deeply concerned. Whatever it is you have brought into my house, take it out now. My dreams have become haunted and evil, and I know that it has been you. I never told her anything of what I was doing, but my actions had begun to cause her deeply uncomforting nightmares. It was right at this time I had my first episode of sleep paralysis. One night I woke up and I could not move. I tried to lift my arm and roll over and even scream. I could get my body to respond to nothing. I tried to force all of my will and thought into something as simple as move a pinky. Nothing. This was similar to any further research and to typical sleep paralysis experiences others have had. An oppressing feeling, hearing things and seeing what's not there. I saw no figures, but I did have an out-of-body experience almost lucid dreaming type of experience. While I was laying there, I sort of lost touch with reality and my physical body. I remember sitting up, but also being conscious that I had never moved and that my body was still laying in bed. While sitting, my soul turned towards the doorway to the basement room I lived in. I gazed across the floor to the doorway, where, through that should have been a set of seven stairs that led straight up and out of the basement. I couldn't move out of the doorway. I couldn't make it out to the stairs. That area of the room to me was a pitch black hole, like the black cloud of Hermias Mora from Skyrim. 
a moving, breathing black cloud. Around me, the hue of the room was a slight twilight, like gray. So it was easy to see that where the doorway should have been was not there at all. I felt supreme fear, but I still stared. When I finally turned back to sitting forward and lay down flat, I was suddenly able to move my body again, like someone grasping back to life after receiving CPR. I deleted all of the occult literature I had downloaded the next day. Fast forward three years and I'm a teenager at Gonzaga University as a freshman. It was a great time, but to stay relevant, it was also a time to grow, to expect haunting nightmares of my own. More than once, I would wake up in my bed as if it were me actually waking up, but immediately I would notice that the crucifix in the room, which I had never seen or even had, would be hanging crooked, not just awkwardly, but as a hard, almost right angle. I know that a crucifix that doesn't hang straight is an indication of a supernatural present. I would get up feeling anxious, but wanted to connect with someone else to know what was going on. Wherever I found my friends or loved ones in these dreams, the same occurrence would take place. They would express deep concern for me and approach to see what was wrong. But when I exposed my face and tried to speak, it would come out as the deepest, most inhuman bellow. Imagine the MGM's lion's growl for whatever I was trying to say. When this happened, in my dreams, my friends and family would literally fall over themselves in horror, trying to get away from me. When I was abandoned and longing, my dream self would be flung to my back and I would experience an unnatural pressure on my chest. Whether this is a possession experience or part of my nightmares, I don't know. But I've had this type of dream at least five times in my life. Throughout the years, I feel a presence that follows me and it haunts me when ever I turn to God or strive to become involved in a holier lifestyle. There was a climatic time for me in 2014 where all of my past flooded back to become a renewed source of haunting. I accidentally ingested a foot spray that was very toxic in my apartment and almost passed out from this. I was lightheaded, disoriented, and far from all there, putting me in a very vulnerable state. I was also scared that I may pass out and never wake up. So I jumped in the car to get myself to the hospital, come hell or high water. A trip to the hospital meant that I needed my insurance card, which was at work. I remember only feeling hazy on the drive there. For some time, I swore that card was there and that I just had to have it for the ER. I pulled up right outside of the building and went into the lobby to call the elevator. At the time, I worked for one of the largest real estate firms in the state as an agent. My broker was a micromanaging freak, so the office was made up of many offices in one large space. The catch was that each individual office was made up of all glass walls. Our broker just had to be able to make sure everyone was always working. What that meant for me during my delusional visit was that the office was full of bright lights from passing cars on the road, twinkling like a kaleidoscope setting in the right light. This was extremely disconcerting. I found my desk almost frightened from the silent and twinkling office and dug through where I thought I had my card. It wasn't there. Could I have doubted myself and have left it in my car this entire time? Around that time, I had this revelation. I felt a most threatening presence growling behind me in the corner of the room. 
I turned just in time to see a mass of unstoppable black, which seemed to be growing to envelop my body in a feeling of hate directed towards me. I tripped over myself out of the office. I didn't shut any of the doors, my desk, the hall, the exit, and ran out. I knew the front door locked itself, so I didn't even think twice about it. The last thing I heard on the way out was the hall door upstairs clicking innocently shut. I made it to the hospital and was nursed back to health. At this time, my romantic long-distance relationship went sour. I knew she was going behind my back and this caused a huge part of our downfall, but another portion came from what she claimed to hear and feel. She was more than a hundred miles away, but was haunted by dragging sounds outside of her room and evil inside the house. One night, she called me and asked if I were home. I was at home myself, far away. She was freaking out about the dragging sounds in her living room, which I couldn't claim responsibility for or explain. She was talking to me when all of a sudden... I lost her on the other end of the phone. I could still hear her breathing, but she disappeared for minutes. Then she was back, whimpering and had been gone long enough to freak me out. She even went as far as to have the house blessed with sage by medium. This was completely against my Catholic upbringing and it almost killed my cat because of how outlandishly he reacted trying to exit the house through a screen window during the process that was five feet in the air. The medium, in their first encounter, told her that I am haunted because of what I have done in my past. I had never told her about my Ouija experience before. She was extremely judgmental and closed-minded. From that experience, she came to me asking questions about things she had no business knowing, like satanic music that had taken its toll, that there was a certain lyric that I had heard that had brought this upon me. I knew instantly what it was, our satanic mantra. I still tried to make it to church. I'm in a relationship in which I am in love now, and none of this matters because I am supported and feel strength in many aspects. I still confess to my Ouija use in the confessional, and I wish for it to go away. Will it return again to haunt me? It's hard to deny a trend of darkness, even though the greatest effort to return to the light. Disclaimer, this is all personal experience. There's nothing made up or embellished here because it's not necessary. That being said, this is written from an all but psychological experience. As you have read, nothing extraordinary or outlandish and described physically. Oh yeah, a follow-up. The night I recalled this and wrote this memory in its entirety, three years ago, police and paramedics came into my house at 3 a.m. My brother's drunk friend got paranoid, had a panic attack, and called 911 when they got home. And while I was sleeping, coincidence again, beware the occult. So I'm extremely skeptical about the paranormal. But this experience kind of blew my mind, so I thought I'd share it. I used to live in a building that had eight separate flats in it. I didn't interact much with the other people in the building, except for the guy who lived next door to me. One of the nicest guys I've ever met. And the guy who lived directly below me. I immediately noticed when I moved in that the guy below me was the opposite of a considerate neighbor. He blasted music at all hours of the night, sometimes for 24 hours straight. Honestly, though, 
I could sleep through a hurricane and it genuinely didn't bother me that much, except for the fact that it was super rude. Anyway, I opted to keep the peace and not mention it. The guy who lived next door to me, Gary, approached me one day asking if I was okay about the guy that lived beneath me playing his music so loud even Gary could hear it in his flat. I told him I wasn't too bothered by it and Gary said he was relieved because he didn't want me confronting the guy on my own. I'm a 20 year old girl and Gary is about 50 so I think he was just looking out for me. I asked why and he said that he'd met the guy years before through work and he'd introduced himself as John. but. When he moved into the flat, he introduced himself as Wes. Gary had gone back to one of the other guys who worked with them to double check that he said he'd switch between the two personalities regularly. So he obviously had some form of personality disorder. I'm hardly an expert on stuff like that, but I'd hear Wes. That's the name of my boyfriend and I ended up using to refer to him. Yelling quite a lot and I wondered if maybe he played the music to drown out the voices or something. I might be way off the mark. Like I said, I'm not an expert. Anyway, one day I found a note taped to my door. Stop your constant banging. I can't sleep. You can tell from the handwriting that it's been scrawled in a fury. Now, I was at work 8 a.m. to 6 p.m., and when I got home, I pretty much sat on my sofa all night. Obviously, I made tea and went to the bathroom too, but I definitely wasn't constantly banging. Anyway, Wes took it upon himself to start banging on his roof. You know, my floor. Whenever he felt I was being too loud. And that's how I know it wasn't me. Because he'd bang at the most random times when I hadn't moved from the sofa for over an hour. Or sometimes at like 4 a.m. when I'd be in bed for hours. My boyfriend knocked on his door a few times, but he never answered it. This is where it gets creepy. I don't necessarily believe in ghosts, to be completely honest, so I never thought much of the weird noises I heard in that flat. I'm living in a building with seven other people after all. In hindsight, my boyfriend said some weird things in his sleep too, but he sleep talks random nonsense regularly anyway. Despite me not believing in ghosts, I do find it super interesting and I have a Ouija board which I occasionally try out. One night my boyfriend and I decided to use it. We'd already used it once before in that flat, but nothing happened. This time, however, it did. Mostly it was moving to random letters that made no sense, but I was still feeling a weird vibe. The candles kept flickering, which I know sounds weak, but I just had a really weird feeling about the situation for some reason. Anyway, then the board says F-I-N-D-M-E. So naturally I ask, where are you? And it says W-E-S-H-I-D-B. O D Y. Like an absolute idiot, I read that as wished body and hastily concluded that the board was talking nonsense. Said goodbye and turned the lights on. To be completely honest, I was getting really freaked out. I thought I could hear things moving, and I didn't want my boyfriend to see how creeped out I was because he believes in ghosts and. I'm always super skeptical about it. Only afterwards, sat down on the sofa, did I realize it had actually been saying, Wes hid body. 
When the realization hit me, I told my boyfriend, whose reaction was, Oh, <laughs> I see, very funny. Nice try. To this day, he thinks I was pushing the board and played dumb to make it seem realistic, but I wasn't. Out of curiosity, I tried to look up local murders or disappearances, but I couldn't find anything. I also couldn't find any social media for Wes or anything of interest about him online. I managed to find out his real name. I still don't know what happened or why the board said that. I'm convinced there's a logical explanation. Subconscious movements, maybe? But it freaked me the hell out. On a side note, how fuming would that ghost have been at me sitting there saying, West shit body, that makes no sense. I moved out of that flat a couple months ago, not gonna lie. I've not used the Ouija board since. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true Ouija stories. Before I go any further, I would like to thank the elite members of Back to Ashes. Sugared Spite, Samantha Place, Colt Stonewolf, Stephanie McLaren, Hemi Slayton, Christy Elias, Tina Me, Cindy, Amy Klimko, Anita V, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Les Crispin, Patty's niece, Denise S., Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, and Cindy Cleveland. Thank you all for your continuous support for Back to Ashes, for without you, there wouldn't be a me, and there would not be a Back to Ashes family. Thank you. For those of you that have already drifted off into slumberland, I hope it treats you comfortably. And if you are awake listening, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. In the meantime, please stay safe out there and take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.